basically what I'm going to do is just go over, you know, what is pain? So, you know, what is it? Where does it come from? Why do we have it? What are the different types of pain? Uh, you know, this, it's very multidimensional. A lot of things going into, you know, why people may have low back pain, shoulder pain, you know, a large variety of different types and different reasons. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll go in a little bit of detail about different types of pain meds that people do take and some of the side effects to them. So, you know, some of the classics, you know, ibuprofen, you know, just like Tylenol, opioids, um, and what can happen if you do take too much of them. Um, and then we'll go through a variety of different types of ways to relieve pain and deal with pain that don't involve pain medications. Basically, the definition of pain that, you know, when we look it up, is physical suffering or discomfort caused by illness or injury. I can guarantee everyone in here has obviously had pain at some time. Uh, how many here have dealt with or are dealing with chronic pain at this time? Right, so 75, 80% uh, of us, you know, deal with chronic pain. Um, and as PTs, you know, that's what we see every day, all day, right? I have sometimes 13 patients a day and every one of them might be for different types of pain. Uh, so the other thing about pain, it's very multidimensional. I talked about that a little bit a second ago, but it's very complex. More goes into it than just, oh, my shoulder hurts. I tore my rotator cuff, right? You know, what else is going on? How much stress is involved in this? Are, are your muscles really tight because you're not relaxing, you're not sleeping well, you know, diet related, um, you know, other areas that might be leading to the pain in this area, right? Is my knee pain, you know, caused because I have an ankle problem or a weakness on one side? So, you know, a, pain's not as simple as we, as I wish it was as a therapist and I'm sure as you all wish it was. Uh, the other thing we got to think about with pain is that it is a defense mechanism. So usually when you have pain, your body's telling you something's wrong, right? So, you know, is there a structural damage? Is it, but it, it's trying to give you that warning so you don't just keep making things worse and worse and worse, okay? Uh, so types of pain, there are, like I've talked about a little bit already, there are a huge, you know, I'm not even listing them all here, just some of the main points, but Pain, you know, you can get acute versus chronic pain. So if I go outside and we were, you know, we're blessed with this beautiful weather, and I slip on the ice this morning, right? Uh, you know, and I slam my knee into the cement. That's going to be acute pain, right? You get that one to two day acute swelling. Uh, one way to really deal with acute pain. Can anybody guess what people do? Rice, Rice right? Exactly. So rest, ice compress and elevate. That's what RICE stands for. Uh, so if you have acute pain, usually you want to use ice for that situation just to decrease the inflammation because that inflammation is going to lead to more pain, right? Uh, so chronic pain can be from 20 years or more a couple weeks. It can be that chronic lingering, lingering pain and like we saw earlier with our hands raised, uh, you know, the majority of people do deal with some type of chronic pain. Uh, so if we go, so chronic pain can, I want to touch base, you can use heat or ice. People always ask this question as a therapist. Whatever's really more comfortable at that time, right? You can, whatever works better for you. Some people like heat better, some people like ice better, but whatever way you want to deal with it to, you know, help with your pain and be able to function a little bit better is fine. Uh, so somatic pain, so that's just really pain that's coming from, you know, muscles or joints. So this guy right here, sore knee. Uh, so, you know, we, that's therapy, that's what we see nonstop, right? Someone coming in with back pain because their muscles are too tight and we got to loosen them up. Uh, but somatic pain, very, very common, you know, majority that I see is somatic pain as a therapist. Uh, visceral pain, that's more from the organs. Right, so you can get pain that's referred from your organs. So you can have something going on in the lungs that leads to, you know, pain in through, you know, the shoulders, you know, pain in your stomach, intestines, spleen, you know, all your different organs can lead to pain in different parts of your body. Okay, uh, referred pain is also very common to see in therapy. If you, ha so one thing we see all the time are trigger points, right? So if you have a muscle that's really tight, you know, I might be tight right here 
but I'm actually feeling the pain down like my buttocks a little bit down the leg. So that pain, the problem can be higher and it can be referred down to different areas. So that's another air, you know, type of pain we see a lot. Phantom pain is more rare, uh, more somebody who had an amputation, right? It's pretty interesting actually. They still get the pain like they have their limb there. So that's called phantom pain. Uh, nerve pain, very common, nerve entrapment, right? You can low back, you know, disc, herniated and it hits a nerve and you get the pain down the leg so that's something we see a lot of and I wanted to add emotional just because there's such a you know stress and your where you are mentally plays a huge factor on pain if you can't relax then your pain is usually gonna get worse because you're so uptight and stressed out and you know not really feeling well right so go to the next slide here. So this is something in school that we learned. So it's the gate theory of pain. So I just wanted to sort of talk about this real quick. Uh, so you don't have to think about the you know a delta C, you know, all that stuff, but let's just explain it uh, you know the best that I can here. So you got pain in your your elbow. Say you know I don't know you hit yourself with a hammer, right? You get that immediate pain. Okay. Well, it's not immediate. It might take a split second, right? Say you put your hand on a burner. You don't feel it right away, right? It takes a little bit of time for that nerve to tell your brain that, hey, I'm, my hand's on a burner, let's get that out of there. But some of the common ones you see are the NSAIDs, right? Uh, we see the acetaminophen, corticosteroids, opioids, so some get into the stronger stuff, mus muscle relaxers and the anti-anxiety drugs, okay? Uh, so if we go into the NSAIDs, so the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, so the common ones are ibuprofen, aspirin, ketoprofen, and naproxen. So you see that some of the common names like Bayer, Aleve, Advil. So you can just go buy this at Hannaford or you know anywhere you really all over the place. Um, but over the counter, what they do is they treat inflammation. So really mild to moderate pain. If you're in severe pain, you know. It, it might help a little bit, but it's not going to really get you to where you would want to be. Uh, also, can help decrease fevers. Okay, so what they do is they block the enzyme that produces what's called a prostaglandin. Okay, what prostaglandins do? So, say I sprained my ankle, twisted my ankle. Uh, they rush to the tissue for normal healing, and they cause swelling. So it's sort of getting that breaking that pattern so you're not getting that swelling right after, right? So it's blocking that inflammation, okay? Um, and that's what, sort of what I talk, talked about here. They cause that inflammation and swelling, okay? So basically you're taking away that prostaglandin when you take, you know, Advil or ibuprofen. So then what can be the problems with that? So if you take, you know, those... And when I say side effects of NSAIDs and I say GI problems, kidney problems, hypertension, heart problems, that's pretty, you, you got to take a lot of them for the most part, unless you have something else, like stomach issues, something going on on the side with that. Uh, but, you know, you, they can cause GI problems. Basically, prostaglandins play a role in digestion. So if you take those away chronically, you, you know, it can really cause some ulcers um, in through the GI tract, okay, and through the stomach. Uh, kidney problems if you chronically take them and or, you know overdo it. Uh, hypertension, so hypertension means high blood pressure, okay. And heart problems? Question mark. The evidence is out there, you know, that if you take them too much, it can cause heart problems. And it's very, they're still doing a lot of research on it, uh, so it's really unknown. But you're seeing new um, papers coming out showing that it can contribute to heart problems later on, okay? Uh, so something to keep our eye on because that's, we don't want that. <laughs> uh, so acetaminophen is like Tylenol, right? So acetaminophen used to treat mild, moderate pain, reduce fever. So same idea as the NSAID, okay? Same sort of purpose. Uh, they're not really entirely sure how it works though, which is interesting when I was doing the research. I mean, usually you'd want to know how it works, right? Um, but what it, they think it does is it blocks the 
it's called COX, which is the enzyme I talked about that makes the prostaglandin at a different level, so at the central nervous system, so through your spine instead of through your peripheral nervous system, which is through your limbs. Okay? Um, so it doesn't decrease the inflammation like the NSAID does because it's more at the spinal level. Okay? Um, the side effects to acetaminophen uh, liver problems, especially if you drink when you take them, okay? Uh, basically, the research found out is it can create toxic toxicity, I can't, can't pronounce that, of the liver from elevation in the serum aminotransference levels. I'm going to test you all that on later, you know, later. Hopefully you wrote that all down. Uh, but basically, if you take too many, um, you know, Tylenol or acetaminophen, you can, studies show it can cause liver damage. So, um, and when I say take too many, I mean you really got to take them. Unless you have some other type of, you know, health condition going on that would amplify it. Uh, so corticosteroids, we see this a lot in therapy. Uh, people on uh, corticosteroids, we actually use some of them a little bit, but not, um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But you see some of the commons, you know, beta-methasone, prednisone is very common, cortisone, dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, right? So they're just trying to really, again, you know, use for asthma, bronchitis, allergic reactions, get rid of the inflammation is what I was about to say and then a lot of times for autoimmune uh, diseases going on so in therapy we use we actually use uh, beta methasone quite a bit uh, we use it with like an ultrasound head and it just diffuses into the skin so it's very localized it's not going through the whole body uh, and that can really help decrease inflammation mm -hmm. locally so decrease that localized pain which is pretty cool uh, prednisone, oh no, excuse me, cortisone you see doctors use, cortisone shots, right, all the time. So someone with low back pain, um, that's just really localized, they're shooting down their leg, they'll shoot that cortisone in, and what that will do is hopefully lo decrease that local inflammation and give someone, you know, decreased pain for, usually we want it to be prolonged, but sometimes it can only be, unfortunately, short-lived with that. Um, but basically what, they, what these corticosteroids do is they mimic hormones naturally made in the adrenal gland that, like we've talked about, can help decrease uh, inflammation. Kinds of different side effects to corticosteroids. That's because there are a lot of different corticosteroids, so I could make this 20 slides probably um, with how much they range. Uh, but they suppress your immune system, right? So they, what that can do is it can increase that risk of infection after taking them. That's why like after you take prednisone sometimes you're at a higher risk of um, getting sick. Um, you see bone thinning if you take it chronically leading to osteoporosis which is just your bones are softer right and that can lead to fractures and all kinds of other problems. Uh, elevated pressure in the eyes, high blood pressure, fluid retention in your you know legs a lot of times, decreased integrity of your tendons which that's never good. Uh, weight gain, suppressed adrenal gland production since you're, pro they're producing, they're not producing, but you're sort of, when you take the corticosteroid, what that's doing is it's mimicking that, what it's producing, so then your adrenal gland doesn't produce as much anymore, right? Uh, high blood sugar, uh, skin rash, and then there are also more. Um, what you would want to do if you ever took something is just you'd want to look at what drug you're taking and then see that, you know, specific side effects, right? Uh, so opioids, this is the, uh, the big topic, right? So opioids are the stronger medications. So these include oxycodone, hydrocodone, morphine, codeine, and fentanyl. So I sort of starred hero heroin, I can't pronounce it, heroin and fentanyl because that's what you're seeing the big opioid crisis. Right, so what fentanyl is, fentanyl is like a man-made heroin, but way stronger, right? So you're seeing that on the, on the streets a lot more um, because people are getting addicted to opioids and it is, can be very, very, very addicting, right? Uh, so the point of opioids is to help manage your pain, 
But what happens is you get the physical dependence and you get you, you decrease your tolerance, right? So your body becomes dependent on these opioids, okay? And then you get this tolerance factor where you need more to get what you need. So you need to take more and more and more, and then again, it's causing more and more problems, right? Um, so what they do is they calm, they're calming, they slow your breathing, respiration, uh, they increase your dopamine, and dopamine is sort of the pleasure, pleasure sensation in the brain. So obviously if they increase that and then you get off of them, you lose that sensation, you know, pleasure sensation in the brain, and then that can cause this, you know, these withdrawals and other symptoms. Um, and it's also an antidepressant too. So side effect to opioids, again, they range widely. Um, Withdrawal symptoms include, you know, restlessness, muscle bone pain, cold flashes, diarrhea, vomiting. When taken in large doses or in combination with alcohol, side effects can lead to death. Like, it's very, these side effects aren't, you're not messing around when you. So, what is an opioid, what is tolerance, right? So, I talked about it a little bit already, but an individual requires more of the same drug to get relief. Okay, so you got to keep taking more and more and more and more. Um, so what the doctors will have to do is they switch from a short to long, long-term long acting opioid. That's usually how they progress it. And tolerance is normal. This isn't abnormal, right? It's just if you take something for long enough, your body becomes used to it, right? Um, so the opioid epidemic, so this is, this is 2016, these stats I found with it. Okay, so the slide I had before was 2000. 15 and that showed what 35,000 I said so 2016 42,000 so it went up even more right so 116 people died daily due to opioid overdose all right about 42,000 like I said in 2016 40 percent of them were from prescription so something your doctor gave you okay which is pretty high um, so then the other 60 percent are non-prescription people you know using it because they are addicted. Um, so 11.5 million people misuse in one year. That's a, a very high amount of individuals, right? Uh, so that's 21 to 29 percent of people who are prescribed with an opioid. So that's a quarter of people who are getting opioids from doctor are misusing them. Um, Four to six percent who misuse transition to using heroin or fentanyl. So you can see if you take 11.5, you take 25 percent of that, and then five percent of that. That's so how many people are transitioning to heavy-duty drugs, right? So it's pretty staggering numbers, right? Um, so close to one million used heroin. And this is U.S. Uh, in the, I think again 2016 uh, and that many deaths from heroin in 2016 um, and that's causing our economy quite a bit of money right 504 billion a year all this you know the opioid muscle relaxers last medication we're talking about you, uh, we see Docs prescribe muscle relaxers early uh, with acute pain just to calm the muscles down. Um, so prescribe early to, for short-term pain relief, okay? Uh, they have a sedative effect, so you sort of get drowsy and sleepy with them. Uh, but they're just used to decrease muscle spasm and tightness and just to calm, calm everything down. A lot of times you see docs give that and then we'll work on them at the same time. So sometimes that can work well together with a muscle relaxer and therapy. If you're dehydrated, your muscles don't work the same, right? You really, your muscles need water. Your, your body is mainly water, right? If you're not drinking water throughout the day, you're going you're gonna to feel it. You're going to be tighter. You're going to have more pain, the majority of the time, at least. Uh, so some basic side effects to uh, muscle relaxers, you know, fatigue, Dizziness, dry mouth, constipation, depression, decreased blood pressure, liver damage, um, and they can become addictive over time. Uh, but again, they usually, doctors only have them for short, a, a short amount of time when you're in more of an acute or really 
spasming pain. You're in a lot of pain. Next uh, subject here. So we're at the alternatives to pain medication. So I try to give you guys a good overview of some of the classic pain meds that you may be using, you may be seeing, you see on the news, right? So now what do we do instead? Right, or what do we do with some that you might be using that your doctor prescribes? And I'm not telling <laughs> anybody to not listen to their doctor <laughs> when they prescribe a pain med, right? They are the experts with pain medications, okay? Um, I'm just trying to give you some different ideas. Uh, so, physical therapy, right? Uh, we've talked a little bit about that. We'll talk more about it. Acupuncture, another idea, another uh, technique people use. And there are more techniques than this. This is just all we'll have time for, right? So if you have any techniques that have worked for you, feel free to share them at the end. Um, massage therapy is great. Another great way to decrease muscle tension. Chiropractic work, yoga, tai chi, uh, improving your diet, like we talked about a little bit. Stress reduction is huge. I can't say that enough as a therapist. I mean, it's hard to get someone feeling better if they are stressed out. Uh, and the last one's mindfulness. I wanted to touch base on mindfulness a little bit. Physical therapy. Uh, so, what we do as therapists, we really examine and evaluate you um, in order to educate you about your condition. So I would really like to give you an idea of what's going on. You need to know what's going on in order for you to get better. Uh, reach long-term goals regarding your pain, function, and mobility, and your goals, right? Whatever you want to do, uh, we try to work with you to get there. Uh, so what really therapy is, is, you know, you, I see someone for an initial evaluation, you know, spend, and this is outpatient physical therapy. There's a variety. We'll try to stick with outpatient because otherwise we'll be here forever. Um, but you would come to therapy, you know, you, you would get a doctor's order for whatever, you know, shoulder pain, neck pain. We do an evaluation, spend a good 45 minutes, an hour, looking at how you're moving, see, you know, look at your whole body, not just right here, just like we said, pain's very multi-dimensional, right? Um, and we're trying to, you know, we develop home programs, so really a lot of it's what you do on your own at home, right? Patients make better progress when they're really doing their exercises, you know, whatever we prescribe once a day, twice a day. Uh, we use a lot of manual techniques, you know, soft tissue work, massage, joint mobilizations, uh, you know, myofascial release, all kinds of different ways to just get things loosened up, get them feeling better, stretching, stretch with you. Uh, also the modalities, so Whoever brought up e-stim, that's a modality to decrease pain. We have ultrasound, traction, where you sort of open up your spine a little bit. Um, just, I mean, there's a very wide range of, you know, techniques that we have. We do a lot of balance work, patients who have been falling, tra walk, train patients walking. Uh, to help decrease fall risk or to help rehab from a sports injury. So, you know, you never know who's going to walk in really with, with physical therapy. Um, and we try to work with you to meet your needs, to find, you know, your goals and meet your goals, okay? Exercise. I just want to touch base on exercise. So, research really shows that you decrease pain and improve function when you exercise regularly. Yeah, so aerobic is a prolonged exercise where it's more like cardio, you know, you're getting a prolonged period, you know, maybe, you know, going for a 20 minute walk. That's an aerobic exercise. Anaerobic is, you know, I'm lifting weights, right? I'm, it's more short burst, short term exercising. Uh, so with any patient, like if you came to me with low back pain, I, I really want you on an aerobic exercise program. And the reason behind that is, it increases blood flow, right? So if you're going for a 20 minute walk, and if you can't tolerate walking, you know, maybe 20 minutes on the bike or whatever we can find that works for you, um, doing an aerobic exercise, hopefully every day, gets your blood flowing. So what, one of the major components of healing is blood flow, right? You need blood flow to heal. So if I have a back problem and I'm sitting around all day, there's not much blood flowing you know, to that site. If you're moving, you know, do pain free. I don't want you hurting when you're moving, but you, we, we need to move, basically. And an aerobic exercise is a great way to get that prolonged movement, okay? 
so the, an aerobic exercise and just exercise in general really benefits multiple systems, right? Benefits your heart, muscles, lungs, right? Uh, you know, mental stress, right? Aerobic exercise is great for stress. How many people like to go for walks when they're stressed out? Well, a, a lot, right? Um, but it gets everything going in the right direction, not just, you know, not just good for strengthening, right? Um, and it also, you know, exercise really avoids your muscles from shortening. I see too many patients who this, you, you sit all day. So if you're sitting all day, your muscles are shortening in that position. So I'll use an example. These front of your hip muscles are, get very tight when we sit for a long time, right? So if you're sitting for a long time, these muscles tighten up, and then you go to stand up and they're shortened and it pulls on your back and you get the back pain or get back pain. So we want to avoid muscles from shortening by you know, we got to keep moving. We we need to change positions. We need to, you know, I tell people who are at work sitting at a desk job for eight hours a day, you got to be up and moving every 20 to 30 minutes or your pain really, it's going to take a little bit longer to get better, right? Um, so starting slowly is big. If You just don't want to go zero to 60 with exercise. If you haven't exercised for two years and you hit the gym and you do grab the 20 pound dumbbells and do 20 of these, you're going to be struggling the next couple days, right? So you really want to tailor exercise, go slowly into it, right? Um, you know, obviously we want to speak with the PCP if you're unsure if you're healthy enough to exercise. I, I mean, I obviously don't know all of your histories, but you want to make sure that you are medically clear to do an aerobic or an anaerobic exercise. Stretching is another key component. I, I mean, we are all, we, we sit too much. Right? There's no doubt about it. We all sit too much. And we get into these forward postures. Right? So I get the rounded shoulders, my head comes forward, and gravity wears us out. Right? Gravity wins the battle. So we get rounded, we get like this. Okay, tight here, tight here, you know, tight through the neck, through these muscles. So stretching is key to fight gravity. Okay? And also working on uh, you know, posture is obviously another biggie. So, Stretching is a big uh, debate over the years, static versus dynamic stretching. So I just wanted to clear that up in case anyone had questions. Static stretching is just you hold a stretch and I'm stretching my neck for 30 seconds, okay? Dynamic stretching is, you know, you see sports teams do it. They're like, you know, doing high knees, butt kicks, things like that. So static stretching is always good to do after exercise. I like to do it. Okay, um, dynamic stretching, and obviously you don't want to just try to look on YouTube and then choose a dynamic stretching program, but if you know you saw a therapist or if you had a personal trainer, usually you do dynamic stretching before exercise to get the muscles warmed and then you would go do your routine. Okay, so what stretching does is it really improves elasticity of the muscles. So muscles really run over each other like cross bridges, okay? So you got layer and layer and layer of muscles. And when a muscle contracts, it shortens, right? Uh, so we're trying to lengthen that muscle to get it out of that shortened position. So like right now we're sitting our shoulders like this. So this muscle is shortened, right? So I go like this and I'm lengthening that muscle. If I hold it, then I'm getting that nice long lengthening, which is a stretch, okay? Uh, we talked about avoiding prolonged positions. You know, you should be up and moving every 20, 30 minutes. Uh, you know, just get up and do a little walk. It makes a huge difference. Uh, when I stretch, I like low load, long duration. So you're not pushing into pain. You're really just holding a nice, easy stretch for a prolonged period of time. Usually 30 seconds is what I suggest. But you're, you gotta breathe and relax into it. People, this is how people do it all the time, <laughs> right? And all that leads to is that muscle being more sore, okay? So it's really, you gotta breathe and relax, breathe in through your belly, okay? And let your body relax as you stretch. Uh, so I'm not an expert with any of the next slides, but I'll just give you a general overview and how they might help with your pain, okay? Uh, so acupuncture, I've never had it done. Has anyone here had it done? You guys like it? Yeah. yeah. So from what I understand, you know, Chinese medicine stimulate points of the body using thin needles, which helps rebalance your energy flow, 
okay? Studies show it can help with chronic pain and stress, um, but can really, is this another method? Uh, massage therapy, we, like I said, we use a lot of massage in physical therapy, but you can go out and see a massage therapist for 60 minutes, longer probably, right? Uh, but basically it's soft tissue mobilization, which helps improve blood flow and soft tissue mobility, okay? Uh, they do myofascial techniques too. So myofascial is basically, you have fascia that is between the layers of your skin and between your skin and your muscle. And it sort of runs like a, I describe it as like a spider web that runs through your body um, that can also get tight. So you want to make sure that's loose and your skin is really moving well, along with the muscles that we stretch out, okay? Uh, so massage therapy really works well for short-term effects, right? You really do well, you know, you feel good, but then it's long-term if you're not stretching and exercising with it, it usually you know, it doesn't last much longer than a couple days. That's what I see in therapy. If I work on someone for 30 minutes loosening things up and you're not doing the stretches after, I'll see you Monday and then Thursday you'll come back and, you know, you might feel a little better and felt good the last two days, but you're going to get tight again, right? You got to do what, do what, what you need to do at home, okay? Uh, yeah, I talked about that. Uh, so chiropractic work, um, like we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, treatment of neuromuscular disorders using manual adjustments or manipulation of the spine. And I've seen a lot of patients do really well with chiropractors. Um, you know, I like to exercise and stretch with chiropractic work, working with therapists at the same time, or if your chiropractor's, you know, giving you some things to work on at home to help keep what they do, um, you know, keep everything loose and aligned, right? Um, and I, I know chiropractors use a lot of those same modalities, which is good too, like the stim, ultrasound. And again, I want to say I'm not an expert with chiropractic work, so <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a therapist. Uh, yoga, so I should do yoga more, I'm not going to lie. Yoga is great to decrease stress, get your body moving a little bit better. Um, for you guys out there, they do have men's yoga, right? So, you know, if you're a little bit stiffer, you fit in the crowd a little bit better, right? <laughs> um, but basically yoga is a system to optimize health and wellness at all levels, okay? Uh, really helps physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental health. And we've talked about multi-complex pain. All that is in pain, right? So if you can improve all that, you should improve pain. So posture and breathing is huge, and proper breathing is huge for pain relief, and that's diaphragmatic breathing. Right, so that's breathing through your belly. So if you all put your hand on your tummy and your chest for me, really when you're at rest, you want to feel your tummy rise and fall and your chest should stay pretty still. You shouldn't feel this, okay? In and out through your belly, that's diaphragmatic breathing, <laughs> okay? All right, so diet. We talked about diet a little bit already. So there's, you know, studies that show anti-inflammatory diets can play a role in decreasing pain, you know, basically eating leafy green healthy vegetables, which we all should do anyway. <laughs> um, then we have avoiding those inflammatory foods. So basically if you look at that, all the foods we should be avoiding, right, uh, red meats, fried foods, soda, refined carbs can all increase your inflammation throughout the body. Uh, alcohol is not good when it comes to inflammation. Okay, staying hydrated is huge. We talked about that a little bit already. Uh, I usually suggest to patients six glasses of water a day. How many here drink at least six glasses of water a day? So not a lot raise their hands. And I can be guilty there sometimes also. Um, but we're made out of water. We got to drink enough water to keep our tissues moving. Uh, and then I, I added personal sensitivities just because like gluten intolerance, we're seeing that more and more, or you just might not do well with dairy. Um, just avoiding the foods that you know you can't handle is big, right? Um, because that will lead to that inf inflammatory response. Uh, so stress reduction is huge also, right? We've talked about how stress plays a huge role in, uh, in therapy or in, just in pain. So biggie is proper breathing. We've just talked about that. Yoga and meditation can be good ways to reduce stress. 
Uh, stress leads to increased muscle tension. We've talked about that. Uh, exercise helps decrease stress. Sleep, sleep. We haven't talked about that too much, but eight hours of sleep can really help with pain and stress. Um, take time to do the things you like. Don't be too stressed out, right? You know, take that time through the day to do what you love to do. That can really help decrease your stress. And you know, I urge if anyone really is stress is out of control, you know, go see a mental health professional if you need to, okay, because they can help. Uh, so I think this is our last slide, but mindfulness. I took a mindfulness course in Booth Bay, I think it was about a year ago. Really interesting stuff that they got going on, but basically being fully present or aware of what we're doing. How often are we just, all right, I'm just zoned out and I, I'm not in the moment, right? So uh, I'll get to that in a second, but yeah, paying attention to the present moment. So really lock into what you, sh where you are. Like how many, I'm guilty. This crowd probably less guilty, but being on the cell phones while doing everything, right? Texting and, you know, everyone's constantly, their minds some at three places at once, right? Um, but being a, paying attention to the present moment so you can enjoy it can be really, huge. Uh, mindful eating is a biggie, really in focusing on what you're eating. How much, how many times do we eat and walk or eat and watch TV? I remember I took the little, it was like an hour seminar on mindful eating. They want you to take, and it's pretty crazy, I don't do it, 30, chew 30 times before each bite to really enjoy your food. And they guarantee you'll eat less, and I, I'm sure I would. They passed around a piece of chocolate, or not one piece, but they gave us, we weren't sharing it. <laughs> and they really wanted you to like smell and enjoy the chocolate first and then, and then take a bite of it. And it was pretty cool that you could actually see, I would never smell chocolate before I'm actually biting it, but you're enjoying all your sensations and your mind's really there. Um, and they really use in mindfulness meditation. So meditation can really help you understand your pain, your body, connect better with it, focus your mind, lower stress, and reduce brain chatter, which we, that's, you know, I'm, I'm guessing at least half of your, your mind somewhere else right now, but uh, <laughs> decreasing that, uh, that chatter, right?